Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about some very boring, um, primitive things way down below the level of Mario's sophisticated talk. Basically, how do you measure how bright things are in astronomical data, which may seem like a really straightforward and simple thing. And for those of you who don't use um, PowerPoint, you'll be glad to know this particular red is 256310 in RGB. Okay. Um, so this is where we may need to have Joe turn the lights down a little bit further. So somebody asked about, sim about precursor simulated data. Um, rather than that, I was going to show you some Hyper Supreme Cam data. HOC is a 1.8 square degree imager on the Subaru telescope. Um, the data I'm showing you corresponds to 280 and 500 visits with the LSST. So it looks like that. Yes, we need the lights down a bit more. Joe, we lost you. Yeah. Can we take the lights down the rest of the way? So rather than generating precursor data, fake data, I'm going to show you some real data. I'm going to zoom in in just a moment and give you some idea of how we're going to be processing this. Here we go. Um, this is something like half a degree or one degree across. And as the lights come down, you should get more and more scared. Um, because this is, let me see, one of these must be a laser pointer, yes. These things are bright stars. Everything you can see at the moment are stars. These are things like galaxies. Um, and as we zoom in, Forget about things like this. This is a satellite that's not been taken out for reasons that I could discuss. This is a GRI composite of data in Cosmos. Okay, and that's down at the pixels. Okay? So, what we're looking at is how you measure the properties of nice... This is a relatively bright star. These are galaxies. This is a galaxy. Here are a pair of galaxies. That's a galaxy. That's a galaxy. That's a galaxy. This is part of a, um, a CTE trail from a bright star. So I'm not going to go through all the image processing involved in this. Dave's looking confused. You can, it's, I'm sorry about the display. These are actually the pixels. Is the speckle noise you're seeing in the background. So what I was going to talk about is how we actually extract the numbers that Mario puts in his databases so we can all do science. So, first of all, the background of this picture is black. But that's only because I've subtracted a pedestal from each image. So, question number one. Where does the background light come from? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that, and then you can tell me the answers. So talk amongst yourselves and think of places that the background light that actually makes the sky not be black when you look up with a big telescope, would be kind of colored, uh, comes from. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay, let's have some answers. The first one's always the easiest. If you go first, you get the easiest answer. Okay. Richard. Diffuse emission from? Dust. Hot dust. Hot at 6,000 degrees. Interesting. Um, somebody else. David. Airglow. Very good. Scatter moonlight. Mike. Um, so the kind of the, uh, physical, uh, physical intergalactic light. Okay, the things I thought of, which covered most of this, night sky mission, that's the aglow, the zodiacal light, Gegenschein, somebody said that, starlight scatter on the atmosphere, I think that's what you meant by dust. Mm -hmm. um, moonlight, galactic cirrus, extra galactic background. So yeah, you got most of those. The other things I thought of were night sky emission from sodium and, mag and mercury, that's from um, street lights, scattered and ghost light from the telescope, dark current in the CCDs, and in the case of the LSST camera, glow from the iron pumps, which theoretically could get into the detectors, I'm told. Okay, great. Here's the spectrum of the night sky. This is what it ought to look like. Here are the oxygen lines, here are the OH lines, 
this is what it typically looks like if you go to Oxford or somewhere like that, where the sodium lines are totally dominant. Great. So, the background level continued. I'm going to ignore the spatial structure in the background. Really, it's brighter over here and fainter over here, and you get junk coming off the telescope and all sorts of bad things like that. So, first thing I can do is I can mask out the objects. Straightforward. So, here's question number two. What measurement on those unmasked pixels should I use to define the sky level? And I'll give you a minute or a bit less than a minute to think about that question. Go! You, you can take part, Mario. Okay, let's have some answers. We should calculate the... Media. Media. Any, any alternatives? Mode. mode. Somebody likes the mode. Clipped, Clipped mean. mean. Okay, popular answers, and I think I heard most of these, are the mean, the mode, the median, or a clipped mean. So here's a question for you. Does the central limit theorem guarantee that the median goes to the mean in the large n limit, the large number of photons limit? Yes? No? Yeah. Central limit theorem, so everything becomes Gaussian in the large n limit, providing that you've basically got a variance? Well, the answer is no. The difference goes down to one-sixth. Pretty useless fact, but kind of amusing. <laughs> because it's one-sixth divided by the gain, so it's written units of the standard deviation, it goes to zero. The correct answer to this question is, you should have used the mean of everything you wouldn't have detected if you'd been under your object. Which is not obviously the same as the mode, and it's probably not the same as the median. You, what you want to do is to measure the brightness of my object, and it's got garbage underneath it, little faint galaxies and fuzz and things like that. If I would have detected them, then I would have excluded them when I did my masking. So it's a little subtle. Unfortunately, though this answer is correct, it's not obvious how you implement this in practice. That's why it says a clipped mean is safer, though. Yeah. So a clipped mean is probably the right answer. And if I were a real statistician, I'd be saying, but clipped means are the wrong thing to do. I should have a model of my outliers. And that's true in theory, but I don't believe it in practice. Well, why would that be why, what is the median? Why do you believe that the median is the number you want? What's magic about the median? It's the middle value. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the background level and I'm going to multiply by a number of pixels. So I want to know, I really do want to know an average. Now, your, your safest estimator of the mean might conceivably be a median. But that's not what you want. What you want is really the mean. Okay. Now, we can subtract the background level. I'm going to do so for the rest of this class. But of course, I can't subtract its noise. If anybody can tell me how to do that, please come and tell me afterwards. OK, so no questions about calibration. I just want to run through this. So what we really want to know how bright stars are in things like Janskis, which are physical units, but not SI units, because that 25, 26 is not a multiple of three. Or AB magnitudes invented by Oak and Gunn. Um, it's useful to know that the flux in Microjansky is, is the, it, the one Microjansky is 23.9 um, AB. That's a useful number. It's not exact. 3631 is exact. So it's difficult to measure absolute fluxes. So when I, as an astronomer, um, I'm talking about measurements, I'm always measuring relative fluxes. And I'm not even going to talk today about conversion to Jansky. So that's actually quite tricky. Happy to talk about it offline. So all the algorithms I'm going to ask you about in this presentation 
are going to be about resonative measurements. So I measure the number of counts in this object. I'm going to then measure the number of counts in a different object. I'm going to take the ratio. I'm going to say, I know how bright that one is. This one is 100 times fainter, which is five magnitudes, according to Hippothos. Um, and then we're done. So these days, we have standard stars over most of the sky, in the north from Sloan, over three pi from pan stars in two months from now, and has been for a couple of years now. In the south, it will soon be DES. Um, it seems likely we can use Gaia, which can give us absolute photometry down to 20th across the whole sky above the atmosphere. It's going to be great. So a lot of the old days of, of astronomy were taking pictures of standard stars and tracking them across the sky, and then extrapolating those to the fields we're actually in. Uh, I think those days are over. Um, Certainly, wherever we have stone photometry, it's good to about 1% or pan stars, and very soon days. You always have stands in the field. It's great. That's enough for calibration. So, a few definitions. I'm going to define the PSF. I'm going to call the PSF 5, because I always do. I'm going to normalize it such its integral is 1. I've written this as a sum, not an integral. I'm going to be sloppy about sums and integrals. They're basically the same thing, you know. Cao Xi may have disagreed, but well, he was French. Um, I'm going to measure the amplitude and therefore the flux of a star as A, and that's measured in electrons. I'm going to take the noise in the background of the hummus galaxies, the same everywhere, and Gaussian. So it has a constant standard deviation of sigma. Those are just definitions. No questions about that. I'm going to make you agree with me that we're going to ignore the uncertainties in the background level, so don't worry about that for the rest of this talk. And I'll remind you that because I'm measuring A in electrons, each of which corresponds to a photon, the standard deviation of A is just its square root. So that's just definitions. That's, that's Poisson noise. OK, so let's start out our exploration of the LSST processing by thinking about bright stars. They're easier. They're easier because I don't have to worry about subtleties, about means and medians and modes, because I've got a billion, I don't have a billion because the CC is saturated. I've got many photons from my bright star, many more than there are in the background. And contamination is less important because they're all faint little fuzzy things. OK, so there's a bright star. Um, this is a saturation trail. So in fact, this star is saturated. This has many more than 100,000 electrons per pixel in its center. These things are ghosts. Um, you can see junk coming off the mirror. These are imperfections in the mirror. This is HSC data. And there are lots of beautiful things behind it. And this is another GRI composite. So this color sort of corresponds to relative for about a half for an elliptical bulge. So let's go to a fainter star that's still pretty bright but not saturated. Well, sorry, this one is saturated. If you look at this, it's got a sort of purplish core and a halo around the outside. And the reason for that is, again, the electronics have saturated. In fact, the CCD pixels have filled and the charge has bled out sideways. And sideways in this direction is in this, sorry, in this case is this direction because we've rotated all these images onto our A deck and don't worry about it. But if I take a shorter exposure of the same part of the sky, I can get back to a star that looks like this. It's not saturated, the center is nice and round. I can go ahead and measure that. So, question number three. What pixel measurement should I make to find the counts in a bright star? By bright, I mean you can neglect the background noise, the noise due to the sky. So you get one minute to discuss with your friends how I ought to measure the flux in a bright star. Go. This means you. This means you. Gentlemen, professors, graduate students, lend me your ears. Um, 
Let's have some answers. We haven't done any from over here. If you don't put your hand up, I'll pick on you. So those of you whose names I know are more likely to get picked on. There's an incentive to make people sitting next to you put their hands up. Dominique! You are right. <laughs> Two or three sigma, sort of a width sigma. You would measure all the flux within a, a circle. Okay? That sounds like a reasonable thing to do. You would choose the largest circular aperture, radius r, centered on the star, and add up all the pixel values. Well, you could have answered that. That was the easy question again. You should have put your hands up for this one. Okay. Now, if you're worried about the spatial structure in the background, which I told you not to worry about, but people like Mike are worrying about it anyway, um, I could choose a larger annulus with the same center and estimate the level of the sky there, because then I've made a local measurement of it. Okay? So that's a clever thing to do. Question number four. Does it matter if I make that background annulus too small? So I'm picking up some of the starlight. And you have, ladies and gentlemen, about one minute to argue with yourselves as to whether it does matter or doesn't matter if I make that annulus too small. Make it smaller in radius. In, in radius. Yeah. Good question, David. Well, I pick my victim. Patricia, yes. what do you think? Uh, but before I answer, ask you that question, actually, David Kirkby, asked, Kirk, yes, David Kirkby asked me a very good question, which was, did I mean that the radius of the aperture was small or the area of the aperture was small? So I hope you're going to answer, you can tell me which of those questions you answered. What I meant was the radius, it was too close in. So, Patricia. Because you said that we're talking about relative clusters. Yes. Why would I scale it with the PSF? Well, because the PSF is very much Okay, yeah. Right. And so we're always picking the same fractional error by subtracting the background. Yeah. So the relative function is still the same. People agree with that? Okay. If I use a median or a mode to estimate the background level, the sky level, is that still true? In other words, if it. it I mean, I, basically, my answer is the same as your answer. It doesn't matter. But it's a little subtle. Because if I use an outer annulus and I take a lot of care to ignore all the light from the star in it, then I'm not going to only, that's not going to scale up and down with the flux. So that's another reason why you should use a linear estimator, like a mean or a clipped mean. So I agree with you, but you have to be a bit careful. That depends on the details of how you do your sky estimation. And to answer David's question, yes, of course, if you take too small an area, you'll pick up lots of extra variance from that estimator. So you wouldn't want to do that. So I agree with all that. So let's go back a little bit. We used a circular aperture to measure, and a reasonably large circular aperture, to measure the flux from my star. What was the variance of my estimate of the star's flux? No integrals are required. You 
have a little time to think about it. A little time to get the answer from your friends in case they know and you don't and I pick on you, not them. The room is very quiet. Does anybody want to know what I mean by variance? It's the expectation value of x minus x squared. What is the of pi? Yes, yeah. And it's all measured in electrons, so there's no gain correction. OK, let's get some answers. Um, somebody, Melanie. Everybody but Melody. Shh, shh, unsh. Yes. Mm, anybody agree? Uh, this is a variant. I didn't need to do the square roots. So it's A plus sigma squared is the proposal. Is that correct? Yeah. OK, I don't agree with that. Um, because you've got a contribution of many pixels of sigma squared. So in fact, it's a plus pi r squared sigma squared. So there's an area of the aperture comes in. And this factor f is just a correction for the fact that I haven't got all the flux from the star. So if I make a small aperture, I miss some of the flux from the star. That increases the variance, because this sum from uh, x less than r is that's less than 1. So therefore, this factor is greater than 1. So my variance is scaled up by a little bit because I missed some of the light. And it's the total flux from the star plus... So the larger the aperture... Well, I told you we could neglect the background noise. So you set sigma equals 0, and then you let r goes to infinity, f goes to 1, and you just get back the plus some noise. OK? So... Your sigma is per pixel, It was when I wrote it down. If we go back to my definitions. OK? So it's per pixel sigma. So that was the warm-up question. It was actually question number five, I guess. OK, how about faint stars? That is a faint star. Now we're going to ask the question, how bright is it? The red thing, it's an M star, almost certainly, in our galaxy. But I'm going to make this easier, because I'm nice, really nice. We're going to assume it's an isolated faint star. So the fact that it's really got a friend next to it and a bunch of other friends, we'll ignore that. So the question is... What pixel measurements should I make to find the number of counts in a faint star? And I'm going to assume that the photon noise in the star is negligible. You can ignore the A in the previous thing. Um, I'm going to assume that the background noise is sigma squared per pixel, to be clear, I'm sorry. Um, and I'm going to assume that I know the central position. So maybe I'm looking at variability. I know the position of the star from some external catalog. Or LIGO suddenly starts delivering positions that are good to a millisecond or something like that. So, under those conditions, how should I go about estimating the brightness of my star? Can I ask a question first? Yeah. Should we assume we know the PFS? Yes. Okay. Yep, good point. Should have put it on the slide. Thank you. <laughs> I should be taking notes for the next time I give this talk. Do I need to know that? We're in the limit. You can't take more data.
Ooh, there's somebody who doesn't dare answer questions. Does this silence mean everybody's happy or do you want some more time? Everybody's happy? Okay. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, silence please. Duke professors included. Yes, sorry, yes, yes. Okay, who wants to give an answer this time? Who haven't I picked on recently? Or volunteers, I'll take volunteers. Okay, volunteers. Oh, not you, you're a ringer. Okay. Okay, so that looks something like this. Is that what you wanted to do? Yeah, exactly like that. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's very good. I quite agree with that. Um, so you make a model, you write down the likelihood, you differentiate, and you find that you have an estimator, A hat, which looks like this. I assume the photon noise was negligible, so I can say sigma equals a constant. And I come down to this nice simple formula, which says the variance is sigma squared divided by a particular sum over the square of the point of the profile. And that's what's called n effective, the effective area. So you know what's coming next. What is the actual value of this in the limit that the PSF is a Gaussian? And because I'm nice, I'm not going to make you do those integrals, actually. But let's think about it a little bit. So we won't make you do the, the integral over the Gaussian, though you can if you like. Um, what's the value of n effective if phi, the PSF, is constant over a disk of radius r? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I can go through this. Straightforward. So my model is that each pixel is given by the amplitude times the PSF plus a noise term. Right? I can write down the likelihood that I got my data, which is just... Um, says that this epsilon thing is a Gaussian. So if you rearrange that, this is just a standard maximum likelihood estimator. If I differentiate that with respect to A and solve the nasty piece of linear algebra requiring uh, inverting a one-by-one -one matrix, I discover that the, this is the best estimate. So it's the sum of the intensity times the PSF divided by sigma squared divided by a normalization factor, which is phi squared over sigma squared. Okay. So you end up with this formula, and to evaluate the noise, you just need to know the 1 over the sum of phi squared. Okay? So we're just trying to understand the difference. So n effective is 1, you get. Then you've only, n effective is unlikely to be 1. But let's, let, can I postpone that question a moment? And you can answer, in fact, you should think about the answer to this, oh, there we go, no we don't. This thing's dying. There we go. What's n effective if phi is constant over a disk of radius r? Uh, okay, let's take the answers. Pi r squared, yeah. So if you're dealing with a circular aperture, the n effective is the area of the aperture. We get back to the bright limit that we had before. Now, a verbose question, and this one, Mike, we will take the answer from you. All right, you won't. Here are the answers. So for the Gaussian case, n effective is 4 pi alpha squared, but alpha is the, the width parameter of the Gaussian. That's quite useful to remember, actually. It says that the, by using optimal, um, some, by doing maximum likelihood estimators, you get an area of 4 pi alpha squared. In other words, a, an equivalent radius of 2 alpha. And alpha is probably around a pixel of a Nyquist sample data. Sigma of the Gaussian, yeah. I don't like to call it sigma because I kept sigma for something else. That's it. Yeah. So that says it's really quite a small aperture. In this, this case that David answered, you get back pi r squared. So it's, it's the effective number of pixels that are contributing noise. And in fact, here's the curve for the bonus answer. 
you get about 90% of the flux back by choosing a radius of 1.585 um, alpha, um, times alpha. That's this thing. And these are various other popular PSF shapes. So you do pretty well by using aperture photometry. You lose 10% even for faint sources. Okay. Yeah. Using circular apertures or otherwise shaped apertures where I measure all the zero, I assume the weighting is zero, 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 one, 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 zero. As opposed to using a PSF weight, for example. I didn't actually say this, maybe I'll say this now. Um, this is the, the, the optimal thing. You take the data you multiply by the model. Now, you can think about that as because this goes is one, well, it's, the normalization isn't one, it's large in the middle, it's zero outside. You're weighting each photon by the probability that belongs to the object. So that's another way of thinking about maximum light investigators. It's also a Wiener filter, if you like to think about Wiener filters for a white noise background. So there are lots of ways to think about maximum light investigators. Okay, now, I replace sigma i by sigma. Oh, sorry, question. Sorry. Signal to noise relative to the optimal signal to noise, which is the, the, the model fit. Radius of the aperture in units, again, of um, alpha, I think. Yeah, and I may have got the normalization wrong with the Komogorov and Moffat thing. I just pulled this out of some notes I have. For my book, which I haven't finished yet, actually, is where it came from. So it's about 1.5 times alpha, and the four-width half max is 2 root 2 log 2 alpha for a Gaussian, which is about 2.3. Okay. Yeah, I gave you the, gave away the answer. <laughs> it's all your fault, Craig. Okay. Um, so, I replaced sigma i by sigma, arguing it is essentially the same for faint objects. Was that a good idea? Yes. Yes! <laughs> okay, who answered it? Okay, you did, right? Okay. We got the answer, but now, could you, would you care to explain your answer, young Chris? Because <laughs> fortunately, I only went forward one. Okay, Chris? You have to see the question before I can answer <laughs> Should I have kept the per pixel barriers, the one over sigma i squared? But you've already answered it, so I don't give, have to give you time to think, do I? Yeah, okay, so it's, it's, it's okay, is it? But I, I don't have to do it. I could decide not to do it. So I'll, I'm, it's, it's okay to sacrifice some signal to noise because I'm throwing away being an optimal estimator. That's your answer, is it, Chris? And you're sticking by your answer, Chris? <laughs> okay, it's, a slight, it's actually a bit subtler than that. Um, it's because, um, and I think, I think I'll tell you what the factor is. It's four-thirds... Um, for a Gaussian. I've thrown away 30% of the signal to noise. But I'm trading off systematic noise, systematic errors for bias here. Because if my model of the point spread function isn't quite right, and I do a per pixel weighting, now the noise in the center of the object is larger than the noise in the outside of the object, because it's got a certain amount of photon noise. So that means that the discrepancy between the model and the data is less important for bright objects. So I'll get a bias. So you're right, the, re the reason you do it is it doesn't matter for faint objects. It biases bright objects. And for bright objects, you've got other problems anyway. Mario. So the 33% is that the signal for bright objects? Yes, in the limit of bright objects for a Gaussian PSF, if you do a different integral, it's, it scales over between no loss at the faint end where there's no noise coming from the object. In fact, it's, you get four-thirds of the photon noise from the object back instead of one. Okay. That was the easy part. That was the warm-up part. If we hadn't been delayed by Mario keeping the, the microphone longer than he should, we'd have been here in time. Okay. So, the object image where he is trying to defend himself is defined once we know its flux and its centroid, assuming we know the PSF. Galaxies are more complicated. So here's a bunch of galaxies. I can zoom in on those. So even nice, well-behaved redshift point three ellipticals like these, they're more complicated. 
And the reasons are they have a variety of radio profiles, they're not circular, they have complicated morphology with spiral arms, they have color gradients, they have a large dynamic range, there's a lot of flux that matters in the outer parts of the galaxy where they're pretty faint, and they have this horrible tendency to cluster. Now, some people think you can use that to do cosmology, which I don't believe, but we're not talking about that today. So, let's start with a simple case, because I'm being generous today, as I pointed out before. We'll deal with the case of isolated circular galaxies where I only care about one band. So, as it were, only the G band. So, there's that galaxy. It's been made circular. Everybody's happy. And the question is, what radius should I use to measure a circular galaxy's aperture flux? So, this is a flux where I measure all the, everything within uh, a certain radius. It's Dominique's answer to the bright star question. It's a bright galaxy. I can forget about the background. It's known to be circular. Its properties are in the, of the stellar populations in the galaxy are invariant with radius. So what radius should I use? In the case of stars, we argued it didn't matter because we're making relative measurements anyway. But galaxies have different profiles. So, ladies and gentlemen, you have a minute to discuss among yourselves your favorite radii. Just remember, you will be required to justify your choices. Okay. I'm going to find the best place to be a drum on this podium before the end of this talk. So, who would like to give an answer? Volunteers, please? Because otherwise... <laughs> hmm. Ah, Woody. As big as you can. Okay, does everybody like that suggestion? Does anybody like that suggestion? There must be some optimal point where the signal to noise is maximized. And how would you... Mm. The ratio of the area of the background times the variance can pair with the circular photon flux of the area. So it would be that same equation that you showed us before. I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I guess I don't know quite what your proposal is. How do I make use of that fact? Can you go, go out until the intensity gets dropped for some fraction of what it is in the center, like a half radius, and measure half is the right thing? Yeah, now that's, that's close. So the normal answers, I don't want to keep you, I'm, I'm going to run out of time too. The normal answers, this one is wrong, incorrect, and I'll ask you why in a moment. Um, the sort of things that you're suggesting, Craig, are things like the crone radii or the Trojan radii. And I was going to ask you what those were, but I won't because I'm nice. Um, as I think I've already remarked. Uh, so there are various radii of the sort that... Uh, Half-light radius is another good suggestion, actually. I should have put it on the slide, though. So this is a mean radius. So you measure R, I, integrated over some radius, uh, divided by the total flux. So that's an average, it's an expectation value of R. Or the Petrosian, which is where the surface brightness has fallen to a given fraction. The local surface brightness is the global surface brightness. And you don't quite do it that way in practice. And a half-light radius is a good idea, too. So those aren't optimal signal-to-noise measurements, but they're well-defined. The reason why you shouldn't use isophotal radii, I could have asked you this, we're going to run out of time, is because things like 1 plus z to the 4 dimming, or k-corrections, where the k-correction means that the spectrum is of the galaxy is you don't quite know what it is. You go to higher redshift, and suddenly they get dimmer because the galaxy is intrinsically blue. So then the radius comes in. So isophotal radii were very popular in photographic days because basically photographic pictures of galaxies go from black, 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 white, 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 and there's nothing much in between. So you just measure the radius in there. So these days people like to use Crohn or Petrosian radii. Now, the way I formulated the question, the answer as big as you can was totally fair. So I was being a bit cruel there. But if I had said reasonably bright <laughs> rather than infinitely bright. So that's why I didn't like that. Okay, elliptical galaxies. Pat was saying, couldn't I please, please think about the problem of non-circularity? Um, it's, it's a bit of a nuisance, but it's not so bad. If I know the shape, 
we're fine. Um, there are ways to get at it. The problem is how you define the shape of the ellipse. I'm not sure if you answered the previous slide, what is the optimal way to do it? There is no optimal way. Galaxies are harder. I've got optimality results for, I, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a better way, but keep going. In the limit that there is no noise from the background, then the answer is go out to infinity. Go out to a very large radius. Yes. And if the other methods are okay. Things like, for large galaxies, Crohn radii and Petrosian radii are quite easy to measure. You have to be a bit careful um, that you get all the flux. So for the numbers I gave, you get 97% for ellipticals, and you get 89%, I think, for its exponent, for spiral, for, sorry, for exponent. You get 97% of spiral galaxies, you get 90, 89% of elliptical galaxies because there's so much light far out, you have to go out to very large radii. But they work pretty well. Um, OK, so elliptical galaxies, it's not so bad. Hubble Supreme Cam uses uh, adaptive Gaussian moments, the way we do basically second, weighted second moments. I don't like that. Elliptical galaxies are a bit of a pain. We'll keep going. Now, we're in Oxford, I'm told, a place of learning. Um, so the previous sentence used the, the, the radius in our formularum on the previous slide. So, Oxford people, only Oxford people need to answer this question. What is formularum? For those of you who like to say formulae instead of formulas, which I don't approve of. Anybody? <sighs> so far is the state of learning fallen off in Oxford that no one is to be found, etc. Yes, to quote uh, Alfred the Great. Yes? It's the Latin declension. That's the whole part of second person. Yeah, I can't remember where the in the Pretty like good. seventh one, the capitalist or something. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's a genitive plural. Genitive plural. Genitive plural, okay. Oxford zero, Duke one. <laughs> Okay. What pixel measurement should I make to measure the number of counts in a faint galaxy? So Woody's answer is now definitively wrong. I can stop even trying to pretend it. Um, in other words, now if the photon noise of the galaxy is negligible, how should I measure the number of counts in some band, say the G band, in a faint get circular galaxy? You may talk amongst yourselves. You have my permission to discuss the topic. Yeah. That's right, yeah. So that's what it should say. Yeah, the photon noise in the galaxy is negligible relative to the background. Would anybody from Oxford like to retrieve your honour by answering this question? <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> Okay, what model would you like to fix? <laughs> 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 fix. Okay, then, okay, one each. Yay. <laughs> uh, you're Princeton now, you don't get to cheer for Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing of that, Joe. Okay, so yes, you fit a model. And the problem is, what model do you fit? And the classic thing to do, a popular choice is a Sursich profile. And that's uh, e to the minus r of 1 over n. The trouble is it's got a bunch of free parameters. It's got a bunch of free parameters in it. You have to PSF to involve it, so your model is more complicated. It's i times amplitude times a surset convolved with a PSF plus a noise term. You can write down the likelihood. But the actual um, estimation is tricky. This is now not just a 1D minimization and matrix inversion. And the other problem is, what if your galaxy doesn't look like a Sursage? Now, as, yeah? Could you convolve the image with the PSF? You, you mean deconvolve the image? Then you'd have to do a double convolution of the model. I think I'm right on this one, Mario. <laughs> you could convolve with one over if you wanted to. 
but you have minor problems in K space at large. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, as with the case of galaxies to stars, dividing its pips by its variance leads to biases. But this gets tricky because you're now trying to estimate the flux, which is a linear parameter. That's pretty well defined. But you've also got nonlinear parameters. Can you really afford to use non optimal estimators when you're trying to estimate the properties of a faint, fuzzy galaxy? Because you want this to work for really quite nasty, faint things, and for things with small REs. And that actually technically is a real pain, because once the effective radius, the half light radius, thank you, Craig, is comparable to the size of the pixels, then making a pixel related realization of your model to be able to convolve with the PSF is really nasty. You have to massively oversample. So in practice, people play games. I won't go into any of the games, but it's not quite as easy as this. Even if you knew this was a good model. We'll get back to model space in a little bit. OK. And of course, we really fit an extra two parameters, A over B in psi, the position angle, or E1, E2, which allow for the ellipticity of the galaxy. It's a bunch of parameters. There also are. I mean, remember, LIGO gave us the position. I've been ignoring centroids consistently through this. So really have to, but that more or less block diagonal, that's not much of an issue. It is if you're worrying about lensing, because then you care about the parameters. I'm just measuring fluxes. So here it doesn't matter so much. OK, so why am I not being a true Bayesian, as I certainly ought to be? Um, I use the maximum likelihood estimator. So implicit priors, because you never really do maximum likelihood. You always assume something boring about your priors, and you're really being Bayesian. So it was a maximum posterior probability with uninformative priors. What priors should I have used when I was doing this analysis? And you have a couple of, maybe a minute to think about that one. Talk, decide. You may have your moment of glory on this question, remember. OK. So, who wants to give me a disposition upon the priors? Who feels? Merlin. Merlin, you're a particle physicist. You do this stuff all the time. You must. Are you from Oxford? No, you're not. Um, you're from Bristol. OK. <laughs> Bristol, Oxford, what's the difference? Um, so, what priors would have been better than non informative priors? If you want to ask Claire Ashiba, I'd be welcome to take. Okay, fair enough. Most people in the field don't think about this either. Would anybody like to answer this question? Yeah, you, Marshall P. So, I like the prior where you say, I don't know what prior is, but I'm going to learn it from all the data I have. Okay. So, something sets with a sensible functional form and enough free parameters that I can learn from all the objects that are then characterized simultaneously. Okay. But. But. <laughs> I guess that's, that might be too hard to do, at least for DR1. So I think maybe I, I'd be happy with uninformative priors, as long as I knew what they were and you told me what the value of the prior was for each sample you take. Okay, somebody disagrees or agrees. So you would like to put some extra parameters of the galaxy, like its color or its something like that, some crude estimate of its size into the, into the, into the priors. That's a good idea. Yeah, so estimate the priors not from the data, but from something with better resolutions. So you don't have to worry about the deconvolution that's going in there. Yeah? That's basically a, an improvement on Phil's answer. I like the iterative approach here. Um, yeah, so I like some. So I like using, at least I think it's safe to use a prior on n. That's reasonably non controversial, yeah. Can't be 27, probably not minus 2. Um, a positivity prior on the half light radius seems reasonably safe. <laughs> Priors on E1 and E2 are easier than A over B. For the position angle, you can use a non-informative prior. A over B is a pretty badly confirmed thing. 
Now, of course, priors on the flux get us into problems with faint counts. Well-known problem I can talk about later. Basically, the probability diverges that the infinitely faint things fluctuate up to have a small probability, have a small, I mean, small likelihood, but large posterior probability. I think I know the answer to that one, but I've never written it down. In general, informative priors of the sort that you all liked get us into trouble because they violate the condition that if I make things twice as faint, I measure it as having half its flux. Now, you may argue whether that's a problem, whether that's a feature or a bug, but it's really tricky. In the case of stars, I think it's unambiguous that you want to make the print linear. If the star is twice as far away, you measure it as being four times fainter because of the inverse square law neglecting dust. Um, so, but in the case of galaxies, the populations do evolve as a function of redshift. So maybe we do have to use informative priors. But then if you're doing star galaxy separation, then you're comparing something that has a prior which is a function of depth to something that doesn't have a property as a function of depth. So your probability of classifying something as a star or a galaxy changes. And if you're interested in the outer parts of our galaxy, finding our alares at 500 kiloparsecs, then you care about faint stars, which are the minority population. So it's tricky. OK, just in the last little bit, sorry. So that's why one reason why we're recording multiple values of the likelihood. But you need to put some priors in just to constrain the models. I mean, you have to do something, because otherwise, these models are really fluffy. Many, many, many free parameters. I'm going to add some more, because I've run out of time. Um, Wouldn't it be better to report the, the actual likelihood, I mean, frequent dispersion changing the widget inside, so then later, instead of, instead of the posterior distribution, so that later, if somebody wanted to, they could apply these priors? Well, that's true, and that's why I'm nervous about these informative priors, like this one and this one. But you need to have some sort of prior on, for example, the positivity of the RE. And exactly how you put that in is tricky. If you put it in as a log prior, then you get, very, you get a lot of power, a lot of weight down in very small REs. So do you want to educate that based on your data? So I agree that you should put out something as close to a likelihood as you can. But because you actually have to minimize very, very, I mean, you have to fit models of things that are really noisy. You have to regularize somehow, and you're using priors to regularize. You can so, just divide out whatever prior you put in, too. You don't have to start with likelihood and sampling. You can have interim plus posterior and samples and relate to whatever you want. You can do that. If we put out information, as, as Mario was saying about, then you can back it out, yes. But I think you have to do something. I mean, you, you can't flip. You, you can't have negative axis ratios. Sure. Yeah. So I have run out of time. I'll just show you what the other questions we were going to have were. Galaxy colors, taking into account the PSF. Yeah? I thought I'd tell. Oh, fine, in that case. In that case. But you don't have to take it off, but you can OK, I thought I'd have a time. Good, we're near the end. We're just trying to make things harder and harder. I started out with the easiest case, bright stars. And then we sort of work our way down into what we actually care about for solving, for doing the science. OK. So what I really want, I might well want to do is to measure the color. People don't care about fluxes very much. If you get the flux of a galaxy wrong by 10%, you get the brightness wrong by 10%, but you don't know the distance to 5%. So it doesn't matter all that much. You have to worry about root n and systematics. But if you want to get the photometric redshift or something, or the star formation history of something, then you really do need to know the colors, I think, arbitrarily accurately, certainly down at the few percent level. Whether you gain below 5% is a question that I don't know the answer to. People say you don't, but I don't believe them. That's what they said about stellar photometry when Sloan came in, where the state of the art of surveys was 15, 20%. So we will see. So the problem is that seeing is different in every band. This is my nice bright star from earlier. But you will observe that it has a blue wing to it, and a red ring, and then a sort of yellowish core. And that's because the data was taken in GR and I at different times. The point spread function was different at different times because the atmosphere was different. 
This is not a talk about atmospheres. If you want to know about atmospheres, go to the last Dark Energy Summer School in Slack or talk to Josh, who gave the talk. OK, the problem is the seeing is different. So how should I va handle variable C? Now, this is only a problem if it's a small galaxy. If the galaxy is M31, I can measure its properties without worrying about the seeing very much. So let's ponder the case that the galaxy's size is comparable to seeing, an arc second, two arc seconds, something like that. So how should I handle variable seeing if I'm trying to uh, measure the fluxes of objects? Who would like to answer this question? I already had the proposal throw away all the data except one sample. Oh, which can, that's what we said. Throw away all the data with bad I see. <laughs> Now, the seeing roughly scaled with lambda to the minus one fifth. So how am I going to get both U-band data and Y-band data in comparable seeing? I throw away all the U-band, do I? Is that the proposal? <laughs> uh, but anyway, any other suggestions? <laughs> I mean, it's tricky. You can throw away the very worst seeing, but we can't throw all of it. That doesn't, doesn't really resolve the problem. Who's going to tell me the answer to this one? You can convolve G band to U band, okay? Or the Y band to the U band. Yes, that's a proposal. You're a good uh, model to the flux in the previous one, and you have it unconvolved. Uh, yeah. Convolve that model with the other seedings and force the on the other guys. Yep, okay. Good suggestion. So we have so far throw away the worst data and hope the problem goes away. We have convolve the bad seeing to be the same as the so the good seeing to be the same as the bad seeing. And we have make a model that includes the point spread function. So when you do the fitting, you can just put in some factor which weights the bad scene with less, with less weight. You don't have to throw it away. That's right. You can do that for every Fourier mode, actually, because you want to so the way to think about it, because the ratio depends on the scene. OK. Um, and here we have the answer. If we're using model fit photometry and the model is good, there's nothing to be done, because the PSF already deals with that. The problem comes if your model is not good. So if you think about the limiting case that my model's a disaster, my galaxy is two arc seconds across, my seeing is coming from DES, so it's five arc seconds, that measures the total flux in the object, whatever model I use. Whereas if I'm taking HSC data where the best seeing is 0.4 arc seconds, then I'm very sensitive to the structure of the galaxy. So instead of being mean about DES, which is somewhat a cheap shot, but maybe I'm using space-based data, say um, Ys or something like that, where the beams really are very big. So it's clear that in the limit of um, that PSF convolution is only correct if the model is returning the total flux. And that's not a bad approximation. So that's one thing you can do. Now, if you're wedded to aperture photometry, you can come up with some scheme, or, as somebody said, a popular alternative is to degrade all the images, or almost all the images, to, some, to the same seeing. I think that's the only absolutely, almost the only absolutely safe thing to do. There is one other safe thing to do. It's bad, because it throws away information. The other thing you can do is use an enormous aperture. But that really has unacceptable noise penalties. So I don't think you can get away with that. So, color gradients. Real galaxies have color gradients. That is a nice redshift 0.5 galaxy. It's got a red bulge, and it's got a bluish disk. Problem. So, what do you do about color gradients? How should we handle this? Now, there are three cases. One, do I want to know the total flux of the object? The next is, do I want to know the color of the entire object? Or, do I care about the color of some well-defined stellar population? And they're different. They're interestingly different. So the last of those is the case I want to know the redshift. So if I could somehow only measure the color of the bulge, I'd be perfectly happy. I wouldn't get the star formation right. I would have to, I would, I would have to use a template that maps to an ES0 spectrum, an elliptical spectrum, which actually would be good because you get better pattern Zs from those. You have to do your probability density, and you have to do your P of Z in color, 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 color space differently, depending on how, which part of the galaxies I'm measuring. In fact, I could put down a chessboard and only measure the flux in the black pixels, not the white pixels. 
and I would still get a consistent color because I'm measuring the, the weights in different square kiloparsecs differently, providing the seeing is fixed. So, and this is a note to you. In many cases, color gradients are better thought of not as color gradients, but as components. I have a red bulge and a blue disc. Now, if you've got a metallicity gradient in a giant elliptical, it's bluer in the outer parts. That's not a very good model, because you need 10 to the 12 um, zones or something in your model. So, if the PSF is the same, and I could have made it the same, which some of you answered in the previous question, and I don't need a total color or a total flux, I could use any aperture I like, and that's good. And a, com a common co choice, and this is a choice that we made in Sloan, Gunn and I made in Sloan, was to fit a model in one band and use that to extract the flux in all the others. And that has good statistical properties. As I was saying in the PSF, aperture photometry, sorry, model fit photometry essentially weights each pixel by the probability, each photon, by the probability it came from your object. So you're doing a matched filter. That's good. You have to worry about biases, because if I fit a model in the R band, I'm doing photometry in the G band, I sort of tweak the model up in the R band. That's true if you're using Crone or Petro. So, question 14, we're near the end. Before you ask that question, I'm yeah. speaking as someone who only the kind of and stuff like that. Yeah. So the color is, I'm sorry, good point. I should write it down. Um, the, diff, the ratio of flux in two bands. So that's what we, we'd normally represent as a difference in two magnitudes. It's the ratio of the flux in the G band and the flux in the R band. And it is a color. I mean, these images I've been showing you are true color GRI. So that the colors made out of G and R and R and R. Okay, so the question is, how should I measure the colors if the PSFs are different in each band? And please consider both the cases that we care about the color of the galaxy and we care about the color of some well-defined stellar population. You may start. You may talk amongst yourselves. So, who wishes to answer this question? Or do you want me to choose? <laughs> Pat. So for the second one. Yep. A weight function in what sense? Uh, so you're doing a sense yeah. And weight, uh, say, the center of the galaxy, that's what you're. Okay. How does that allow for the fact that PSF is different? So the actual image you're looking at is different. So the red bulge has been spread out more in the bluer bands because the seeing is worse. The trouble is, when you look at the image, some of the structure there is coming from the point spread function, some is coming from the astrophysics. So you put it all in your model You put it all in your model fitting. Okay. Michael. Oh, sorry. Oh, we'll go with Michael. Okay. So what sort of model should we be fitting at this point? Do you want to answer that question? We, we, we have, we're doing model fitting. I agree with this. I'm a great believer in model fitting. I'm one of the first people who did a lot of model fitting on billions and well, hundreds of millions of objects. But there are issues. So what sort of model would you fit? So such model? No. no. Uh, yeah, so such model. Okay. So single surcis? Dual surcis? Dual surcis. A different surcis for each population. And we're going to fit each of the to a double surface in each in each in each image. That's a lot of parameters. Even if we free up the centroid, I mean, don't free up the centroid, as David said. So I think I basically agree. The trouble is, okay, if we fit a model that's flexible enough to recover the total flux, this is my point before. It has to be the PSF convolution only helps you if you get a good enough model. So then the PSF deals with it. And the sort of models people usually use are something like two component models where you don't free up the, the components. This is why I gave you a hint about don't think about color gradients as being gradients in color. Think about them as being multiple components with well-defined colors. So if I've got two well-defined components, I just want to know that they've got different, each has a different color, then I can do that by fitting the parameters. 
the things people like to do are bulging disc or the lens fit, which was actually done for sheer freed up. I can't remember what it freed up now. It freed up something slightly different, but it freed up a sort of another parameter that's kind of similar to that. So I think that works. The other thing we can do is degrade the seeing to a constant and fall back upon the nice, easy life we had until I introduced variable seeing. Okay, so what should you do, this is the last question, if the galaxies are not isolated? <laughs> so this is what real galaxies look like. Um, and they look like this, and they look like this, and 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 this. And I'm going to answer this one myself. The answer is, you invite me back to another death summer school to talk about deep blenders. <laughs> okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, ladies.